Yeah, you can switch. And John, you're ready to go? Okay, so just by way of introduction, uh, an immediate thanks to John Lorch for his willingness to come speak to council. John has spoke, uh, John, as I told you earlier, um, Director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, good friend of the Institute, interacting on many different levels. He's come and spoken to this council once before um, uh, to give an introduction to his being the new director, at that time a new director, of, of the Institute. But he's here in a different capacity today, um, one that um, both he was interested in coming and talking to this council, but it's even bubbled up out of discussions we've had with council. Um, one of many hats that John wears is um, co-chair, along with Steve Katz, of, of an important group that this council has heard about called the Scientific Data Council, a trans-NIH group that is part of the governance system that's a very, that Francis Collins created a number of years ago to deal with all the unique challenges that we're now facing in biomedical research data. Um, and having a trans-NIH strategic group thinking about many different issues, a large subset of which we talk about at this council meeting. And so um, in, in that capacity, uh, John, and I'm a member of that uh, scientific data council, um, and, uh, and John is the co-chair. And among the many things we're dealing with, John's going to talk about some of it, is the development of a strategic plan for data science at the NIH level that is now reaching a very mature state and is highly relevant to some of the things we've talked about here. And so he's going to tell us. Keep stalling. Uh, keep stalling. Yeah, I, 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 I know what button to push. Do you know which button to push? I know what button to push. That one. Ah. It's killing me not being able to push it. Nice work. <laughs> so, um, so in any case, uh, I'll, keep, I'll keep rifting. But uh, that's what he's here to talk about. And um, as you will quickly uh, figure out, among the, first of all, NHRIs and Drummond's going to be very interested, obviously, in the data science challenges um, with certainly genomics, as I've always said, being a bit of a poster child for some of these challenges, but not the only data types, not just genomics data, but in particular, um, some of the issues surrounding uh, data resources that are uh, many of which uh, are, or actually many institutes fund. We fund ones related to genomics. Um, this council deals with the complexities of supporting those and lots of discussion about how in the long term these are going to be sustained, especially at a trans NIH level. And as John's going to tell you, some elements of this new strategic plan directly try to put a framework together for long term sustainability of these important trans NIH data resources. So okay. with, I'm done Thank rifting. You. It's up. You're Thank ready to you, go. Eric. We okay. solved that data science problem. There are a lot more to solve. That's what I'll tell you about now. Um, so I want to tell you about the strategic plan for data science that was developed by the Scientific Data Council, as Eric said, in conjunction with um, the IC directors, NIH leadership, and a lot of input from the community. It was actually requested by Congress in the 2017 Omnibus Appropriations Bill. Uh, it was really, I think, a, a very um, insightful thing that they did request that because it allowed us to sort of galvanize everybody into developing the plan in a relatively short period of time. Overarching issues that the plan focuses on, first, are modernizing the data resource ecosystem to increase its utility for res uh, researchers and other stakeholders and to optimize its uh, effic efficiency of operation. I just want to pause there and, and really highlight that part of the sentence in red, which is to increase its utility for researchers and other stakeholders. And in some ways, although that sounds obvious, this is a shift for the way NIH and uh, I think the, the ecosystem in general um, is approaching this. For m many reasons, most of them historical, I think the focus from NIH's point of view has been on the, the resources themselves, the PIs of those resources, what uh, their sort of needs are and their uh, desires are. And we're really trying to focus this instead on what is best for the research community. What are the resources? and their organization and their construction that will be most useful for the people who actually use the data and not for the resources necessarily themselves, what is most convenient, which I think maybe has been more of the emphasis. We want to enhance data sharing, access, and interoperability, improve ability to use electronic health records, which is obviously an area of really rich potential, but a very difficult one right now, uh, as well as observational data for research while at the same time ensuring confidentiality of the data in those systems, which is obviously a critical issue. And finally, underpinning all of this is modernizing the infrastructure, which this is all built on, as well as increasing our capacity, that is, training um, and other related issues. 
few definitions. So we started out having to define what we even meant by data science. And so the de definition that NIH agreed to is shown here, an interdisciplinary field of inquiry in which quantitative and analytical approaches, processes, and systems are developed and used to extract knowledge and insights from increasingly large and or complex sets of data. So that's our definition of data science. And then Eric already mentioned this term, which is an underpinning of the entire plan, which is FAIR. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That is, all the data that NIH supports the sharing of um, should adhere to these FAIR principles. Now, in order to tackle this, we actually broke what we uh, thought of data science as into five different domains, and you could parse them differently or you could subdivide them further, but this seemed convenient to us. The domains that we focused on were data infrastructure, that's the hardware, the platforms, the architecture, et cetera. Data resources, so those are the methods, practices, and features that are used to increase the value and utility of data beyond its native state. So these are things like as we'll talk about in a second, the databases, knowledge bases, et cetera. Management analytics uh, and visualization tools. So this is the tools, programs, software, et cetera, which actually allow people to make inferences and insights from data. Workforce development. So this is a capacity building piece. And policy, stewardship, and sustainability. The policies that we have in place that allow us to actually meet the other four parts of the domain in the optimal way. So the organization of the plan is, is shown here. It starts with overarching goals. Those are each of those big domains, basically, and what are we trying to do in those domains. Under each of those goals, there are one or more strategic objectives. So how, in more general terms, are we actually going to achieve those overarching goals? And then underpinning each of these strategic objectives are more specific implementation tactics. But I should say, this doesn't get to the level of granularity yet of actual implementation plans in general, in general, and that's the phase that we're now embarking on. And then under each of those implementation tactics are going to be milestones and performance measures. And so I'll tell you about the overarching goals, the strategic objectives. In some cases, I'm going to show you implementation tactics. In other cases, I'm just going to give you some general ideas. I won't tell you about the milestones um, and um, metrics yet, because those are being developed as part of the actual implementation plans. So the first overarching goal is to support highly efficient and effective data infrastructure. It has two strategic objectives. They are to optimize data storage, access, and security. And a really important point here that we sort of came to early is that we really need to rely, when possible, on the private sector, because they are the, the, the experts uh, in doing this. That's where most of the developments in technology um, and, and practices are happening, and we really don't want to be spending time reinventing the wheel and spending money on things that industry can do a lot better and has already done in many cases. So we're going to leverage what's happening in industry when possible rather than trying to reinvent it. The second uh, objective is to connect NIH data systems together. So uh, I'll talk in a minute about the NIH data commons uh, strategy and idea. Um, that will be one of the hubs to connect the data systems that NIH operates together, but we also think that NLM, particularly NCBI, needs to be a core hub in this, in connecting the systems that NIH actually is supporting itself and running itself together. So the commons, um, I think probably most people in this council are familiar with this idea, but it's, it's going to be a cloud-based system, and as Eric mentioned, it's already under development. So one or more clouds in which high-value generally consortium-generated NIH data sets are going to be placed. And the, the initial data sets, as Eric said, were TopMed, uh, GTEx, and um, the consortium of the model organism databases. These will be linked together using the FAIR principles so that they can be interoperably searched, the data can be found, and then those data can be used together in some way rather than having them siloed as they currently are. And so users from the outside will be able to gain access to these data use them in different ways, and hopefully advance knowledge by being able to connect disparate kinds of data together uh, under these FAIR principles. And if you want to learn more about it, uh, there's information on the Common Fund website. The second overarching goal is to promote the modernization of the data resource ecosystem, and I'll spend a fair amount of time talking about this because I think for this council there are some really important um, conceptual changes that we're making that um, 
we'd like your, your thoughts on and we'd like your help disseminating. So the first is to mo and, uh, objective is to modernize the data repository ecosystem. The first implementation tactic underlying that objective is to separate the support of databases and knowledge bases. Okay, so this is something that um, received a lot of feedback when we put this out for public comment, both positive feedback and some less than positive feedback. And I think this is going to be an area where some significant change management is going to be required. Again, I want to emphasize the goal here is to make this system and these uh, data resources more useful to the community. Okay, and so that again sounds obvious, but it's a shift away from the way we've approached things in the past. So what do we mean by databases and knowledge bases? What is the separation? So databases we're defining as data repositories that store, organize, validate, and make accessible the core data related to a particular system or systems. So just as an example, what we mean by core data um, for the kinds of things that most of you think about would be things like the genome sequence, the transcriptome, and the protein sequences. So this is data that, um, although it is evolving and more is being added, is probably not changing at the same rate um, in terms of its um, exact um, you know, nature as other data you might find in a, di a different kind of data resource. Now, when we put this out for public comment, um, one of the issues that came up um, from some people was that although that part of it is important, the core data aspect, another significant issue has to do with the level of curation, particularly human curation, in different data resources. So for databases, as we're construing them, although there is some curation necessary, it's mostly to do with quality assurance and quality control. Right? It's not adding additional information or different levels of knowledge on top of the core data. That is the job of the knowledge bases. And so what a knowledge base does is accumulate, organize, and link growing bodies of information related to core data sets, one or more core data sets. So again, examples from the world that most of you inhabit would be things like expression patterns, splicing variants, localization, interaction networks, and pathways um, from one or more organisms. And frequently, in knowledge bases, there's also a lot of publication information, information that's being gleaned from the literature and then incorporated into this infrastructure or this framework in order to hopefully make it more convenient or easier to um, make discoveries. Again, the community um, made clear to us that they thought a distinction that was important really had to do with the level of human curation. And generally, knowledge bases require a great deal of curation typically human curation. Okay, and so this is the distinction that we're making. Elixir, which I think many of you are familiar with, which is a consortium of 20-some European countries that are wrestling with these same issues, has made a similar distinction, and they actually commented on the strategic plan and applauded us making this distinction. They don't, make, they don't use the same words as we do, database and knowledge bases, but this conceptually is very much along the lines of what Elixir is also thinking about and working towards in terms of their organization. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the first implementation tactic. Then under, in addition to that, and underlying the strategic objective, we want to use appropriate mechanism, review, and management uh, to support and evaluate each of these different kinds of repositories, databases, and knowledge bases. I'll tell you the importance of that in a minute. We also want to dynamically measure data use, utility, and modification. A really important issue is what data are we going to store? How long are we going to store it? When are we going to move it to some sort of cold storage? And when are we maybe even going to just jettison it all together because it's not useful anymore? We can't store everything forever. That's been made abundantly clear by experiments like dbGaP, for example. Um, we want to ensure privacy and security for information that is personally identifiable and sensitive. That's critically important. Create a unified, uh, efficient, and secure authorization and access to these kinds of sensitive data. We can't have every system that has sensitive personal data in it using different protocols to get into it. That's completely inefficient. So we need a trans-NIH solution to this. It's actually one of the things that's already in the implementation phase, uh, but a single point of entry, a single way of uh, authorizing and determining what level of access different data sets have for different users. And employ explicit evaluation, life cycle, sustainability, and sunsetting expectations for the resources that we fund. This is not to say that every resource is going to be sunsetted in some you know, near-term period of time, 
But this needs to be an explicit part of the discussion during evaluation, funding, et cetera. Because again, we can't fund all data for all time. And we have to make decisions about what's important and when it's no longer as important. Okay, second um, objective is to support the storage and sharing of individuals' data sets. So much of the discussion we talk about data sharing tends to revolve around these large, what are frequently called high value data sets, generally made by consortia. That doesn't mean that other data sets aren't high value, but hopefully the ones that we're storing from GTEx, et cetera, are. Um, the problem there, of course, is that most of the data being generated by the research community is not from these large consortia. It's from individual labs doing their individual work. And so we really have to find ways that the data from that work, the individual labs, that is, again, worth sharing, um, that we have a mechanism in order to do that. And again, this needs to be fair, it needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, et cetera. And so how are we going to tackle that? Well, initially, and NCBI is already working on this, what we're going to do, or NCBI is going to do, is to make it possible to link data sets to published papers in PubMed Central. So you publish a paper, and they're going to make it possible that you can actually just attach the data sets um, to that, and so people can find them and use them. Eventually, that's going to evolve to something that's more fair-like, that is, you can find them easily there in some kind of standardized format and hopefully uh, move towards interoperability. Longer term, the goal is to expand the data commons once it leaves the pilot phase, assuming it's successful, to allow people to submit their individual data sets into this cloud commons environment, again, in a fair, compatible format. Well, again, we do have to think about what will be the rules of entry, right? Will you put anything up there? Or is there going to be some kind of standardization of what goes up, how long it can stay there, and how we're evaluating whether it should be there or not? The third strategic objective under the second goal is to leverage ongoing initiatives to better integrate clinical and observational data into the ecosystem. There are um, several um, tactics under that, creating efficient linkages among these NIH data resources that contain this kind of information. Again, they shouldn't be silos. You should be able to use them together to um, synergize and optimize um, the utility. Again, we want to develop and implement universal credentialing protocols and authorization systems. I already mentioned that. Um, and promote the use of NIH common data elements repositories. So this is something that NLM is leading. It's common data elements for clinical type data. If everyone's using different data elements, there are no standards. Obviously, the utility is very low and getting to a fair principles-driven environment is going to be extremely difficult. And so that's something we want to emphasize. And again, whenever we're talking about standards, community-driven standards are, are critical. And it just doesn't want to oppose them in general. It wants the community to develop them and therefore use them. And so the kinds of things we're talking about here are, say, all of us, um, the Emerge Network from NHGRI, Moonshot, TopMed, Echo, et cetera, are the kinds of things that we need to make sure are linked together, are not silos. And as new resources of this kind are launched by NIH, they should already be primed to just fit right into this system once we make it uh, interoperable, as we're, we're hoping to do here. The overarching goal, number three, is to support the development and dissemination of advanced data management, analytics, and visualization tools. The first strategic objective um, there is to support useful, generalizable, and accessible tools and workflows. And the implementation tactics under that should look somewhat familiar to you. So the first one is separate support for tools now from the support for databases and knowledge bases. And I'll get to the importance of this in a second. And again, we want to use appropriate funding mechanisms, review procedures and criteria, and management for tool development, just as we want to do that for databases and knowledge bases. We want to leverage commercial tools, software, workflows, and expertise. So again, we recognize very early on that there are many things in this space that industry is way ahead of NIH, and we just will not catch up and should not try. Um, we should really leverage what they have. And so that's an important principle here. And finally, promote the development of open source, openly shared, and reusable tools, software, and workflows. So as, as much as possible, we want these things to be free to users. We want them to be open to users, and we want them to be open source so that people can actually improve What's, what's there. And I'll get to the more details of this in just a second, but let me just go through the other two objectives under this goal. Broaden the use of specialized tools. So we recognize that 
um, you know, not all tools that are useful for biomedical research originated in biomedical research. An example would be algorithms from astronomy that have been adapted for use in cellular imaging. Um, and there's several examples of that. So we want to support um, ways for tools and algorithms and approaches from other fields, physics, uh, engineering, computer science, et cetera, to move into biomedicine as fast as they can. We also want to support research for improving methods for using electronic health records and other clinical data when we have dozens or even hundreds of different systems at thousands of different institutions. Um, it's very difficult to really mine this gold, gold mine, essentially, of electronic health records. And that's something I think that additional research is required to figure out how to do in an optimal and secure way. And finally, the third objective is to improve discovery and cataloging resources. So again, if, if we're going to have a fair, compliant ecosystem, there need to be standards. Our view is that in general, the community, the experts need to develop these standards but then they need to use them. So the, the goal is for NIH to serve as a convening body, hopefully with the help of professional societies, and FASEB has already expressed a strong interest in being involved in this. Um, but developing those standards and then finding ways to ensure that they actually get used, because if standards are developed and they're not used, they're not uh, useful at all. Okay, so let me just tackle this, because I think, again, this is something that will be of interest to this, this council. Why do we think we should separate the support and evaluation of databases, knowledge bases, and tool development? Uh, that's come up twice in both uh, Strategic Objective 2.1 and Strategic Objective 3.1. And there are a number of reasons that we think this is going to be of great benefit to the overall research community. The first was kind of an overarching one, and it, it is general and doesn't have anything specifically to do with each of those domains. But it's that historically NIH has funded data resources and evaluated them during peer review as research grants, right? And, and this makes sense because all of this dates back to the 1980s and 1990s, I mean, literally. The system has not changed dramatically since that time in terms of how we are supporting these things. And in those days, these really were research projects. You know, you start off with a book, which is the fly genome, and you got to figure out how it's going to become digital, that was a major research endeavor. But we just kept using those mechanisms. And so once these things became much more hardened resources, we, we NIH did not shift away from that paradigm. And that had a number of implications. First, there was a misalignment of the goals and review expectations. If we were funding them as research, they needed to have innovation, they needed to have sort of hypothesis generation or testing, et cetera. And that was the focus of the review rather than what we really should have had, which is a focus on user service, utility, and efficiency of operations, the usage of the database, et cetera. Okay, and so what we want to do is shift away from focusing on these as research projects, which in general, the, the hardened ones at least are not, and think about how useful they are to the community and how much value the taxpayers are getting and the research community is getting for their money for these. The other thing that this has led to is that there's been an entanglement of tool development with resource management. And that's because if you want to meet these innovation criteria when your grant, uh, your resource grant is being evaluated as a research grant, you generally put in development of new tools, right? That's how it's going to be innovative research um, sort of aligned. And what we've heard from many reviewers as well as a variety of councils is that this has in some cases led to panel is being reluctant to say the tools are really not the highest quality, maybe the people running the databases or the knowledge bases aren't the best people to be making the tools um, because they don't want to lose the core resource itself. So you can imagine if you have a core genome resource for a particular organism or system, the panel is very reluctant to give a score that reflects the fact that they don't think the tools piece is actually at the cutting edge because they don't want to risk losing the core information. And that's completely understandable. Our council and other councils sort of felt the same way. Um, and therefore, that led us to the realization that we really need to separate these things, okay? That tool development should be evaluated and funded on its own merits, separate from the importance of the, say, core data itself or the knowledge base piece itself. And so that's what I just said. 
The other issue is that database and knowledge base functions, needs, and uses are not the same. And that's why we think, again, they need to be evaluated separately, funded separately, using distinct mechanisms that can be targeted to their specific goals uh, and needs. So core data, for example, genome information, protein sequence information, could be absolutely, and is generally absolutely essential to the research community, but it's a question of whether the knowledge base part of that you know, the additional pieces, the publication information, the other experimental information that's put on top of that is. And in some cases, certainly it is. In other cases, it might not be. And this is another area that we got feedback from, you know, study section members and councils was that they felt that, again, frequently reviewers were reluctant to say, hmm, not all of this knowledge base, this curation stuff that's going on is as useful as it could be because they didn't want to jeopardize access to the core genome or protein sequence information. And again, we need to separate those things so that we can evaluate them on their own merits and not feel that somehow um, the core genome information is being held hostage to this other stuff that's going on. Another issue, as I alluded to before, is the cost of human curation is extremely high. So in many of these data resources, 40 percent or so of the total costs are for human curation. So it's a lot of money that's going into, into that activity. And again, it goes back uh, decades, and in some cases it's still necessary, it still needs to be done that way. In other cases, it probably doesn't. And if you just think about what science was like in 1990, say, um, getting information about key papers in a field that was not entirely trivial. You had to go to the library and look in those big green books and remember that whole thing. Now we have Google, now we have PubMed. Right? And so it's a very different world, and I think we really need to critically ask ourselves what's worth the money and what's just a historical artifact. Okay, now I'm being pretty uh, aggressive and upfront, but I think these are issues that we really need to have on the table and not just dance around. And finally, the need, uh, we, we really have a strong need for usage, utility, and impact and efficiency metrics for these kinds of resources. Again, how much are they being used? How much impact are they having on the community? How big is the community they're serving? Um, the data within them, again, how much is each different data set being used that decisions can be made about what to keep and what not to keep? We don't really have good ways of measuring this yet, not at least in a coherent way, and that's a key part of what we need to be doing, figuring out how to do that. I do want to clarify one thing that's been a source of confusion. Although we're talking about splitting up the evaluation, the funding decisions, and the organization of database, knowledge base, and tool support, that doesn't mean that the same group couldn't do all three of those things, right? It may be that the database part is essential, their knowledge base piece is really important for the community, and they are the right people to be developing the analytical or visualization tools to use the data. Okay? That could be entirely true, but we need to be evaluating each of those things separately to ensure it's true and to ensure they're being done as efficiently as possible. Okay, now, um, I did come up with a little graphic to try to make one further point that builds on this, which is another really overarching issue, and it gets back again to trying to focus on what's going to be best, most useful, and most efficient for the research community. So this is the artist's conception, the artist being me, um, and Brent's laughing, I guess, because he's a hundred times better uh, artist than I am, but this is our conception of what the current or a little piece of the current uh, data resource ecosystem looks like. So the first thing you notice is it's highly siloed. So you could think of this just to push and be a little bit more upfront here. You could think of this as part of the model organism database ecosystem, right? Each organism is a silo, more or less, right now. Um, in addition, as I said, there has been a conflation or an entanglement of the different functions. So the database piece, which is the hexagons up here, that doesn't work, the hexagons um, is part of each of these data resources. The knowledge base piece also is, that's the uh, cylinders, and then incorporated into those is also this tool development that's going on. So these are now inextricably linked to each other in ways that make it very difficult, again, for us to assess their utility and efficiency. What might be, and is to us more appealing, would be something that looks like this. Again, you can think about this as a model organism database uh, reconstruction, but we have at the center core 
the support and organization of the databases. This may be the genome information, the protein sequence, the transcriptome information. And I've actually arranged it so it's not just a single one, but now all of the organisms in this particular space, their genome sequence, for instance, is linked together in a completely seamless, interoperable way. So instead of going into each database or knowledge base and pulling out the sequence for flies and worms and Saccharomyces separately, and then going and doing your alignments or whatever else you're going to do, seamlessly you could go in and see all those things immediately together, right? How much more useful would that be to you as a user than the current construction of the system? Um, now, I personally think it would be great if that could happen through NCBI as kind of a one-stop shop, but, you know, it could also be some organization in the outside world um, that does it as well. But having it all together, I think, as a user myself, would be dramatic enhancement of current capabilities. Then a right around the outside is the knowledge base piece, and we sort of honed the knowledge base pieces just down to their most important components, so they're not maybe as expansive as they were. And note they're all linked together, and they're also linking into the genome and protein sequence information in the middle. Um, <clears throat> so when, in terms of linking them together, the thought is, what if the additional information that you would get in a model organism database, for instance, currently, this knowledge base piece, were all built on the same platform, right? So it was all seamless, that when you looked at, you know, the expression patterns in one organism, it was giving you the same visualization, the data were organized in the same way as in another organism. So you could actually easily use it all together and the, you know, need to learn different platforms and different systems had disappeared, right? So that, again, I think would be a major advance and increase in efficiency and usability for the ecosystem. And then finally, on the outside is where the tools live. And our idea here is this is a sort of tool depot. Um, and there are commercial, or not even commercial, but there are examples of this now where people can put tools, they're freely shareable, people can even modify them if they're open source, um, and these would be hopefully as free as possible and as open as possible. And all of these different layers can communicate with other layers. So the tools can communicate directly into the, the core data or the knowledge base. The knowledge bases can communicate directly into the core data, um, all in a highly interoperable, interconnected way. So again, I just ask you to think, wouldn't this be a lot more useful to you as a user than the current siloed and entangled ecosystem? Now, I showed this at a meeting where Jim Ostell, the director of NCBI, um, happened to be, and it turned out it resonated with him because as he thought about it, he realized that this is um, actually the way that NCBI tries to organize itself. And so he, he had this picture, which is much, much better, obviously, than my pictures, um, drawn up, and it shows how the core data sits in the middle, or right around the outside are various knowledge bases that um, actually interconnect with and, and use data from uh, NCBI currently, and then the around the outside are tools that they have organized for use of these various things. And so again, I think, and this is my personal opinion, that what we really should be focusing on at some level is expanding this NCBI model so that it's a one-stop shop for many of the things that we all want to do. Um, you know, it's a place that has a, a brand, has some expertise, and could be, I think, brought really into the 21st century to make it as useful as possible to everybody. Okay, very quickly, since I'm running out of time, um, the last two goals are enhance workforce development for biomedical data science. The, four, the three strategic objectives are enhance the NIH workforce, so that's internal. How do we get program staff, um, intramural scientists, et cetera, uh, who have cutting edge knowledge and skills in data science arenas. One idea, uh, two ideas, one is to increase the actual training, and again, that's something NCBI has already started, and I think we could expand uh, there. Another thing that is, is being worked on right now is something called the data fellowships, which would be a national service fellowship where people from industry or academia could come for two or three years um, as a sabbatical, essentially, or before they start something else, um, and work on a high-profile, high-impact project, bringing skills that NIH doesn't have readily available, and in general, can't afford because, you know, someone can go work for one of the major tech companies for three or four times the money that we're able to pay. And so this may be a way to bring people in for national service on something really high-impact, all of us you think of, Cancer Moonshot, these kinds of things. Um, and bring in knowledge and expertise that we simply don't have access to in a straightforward way.
The second one is to expand the national research workforce. Uh, the original statement of, of one of the tactics was enhance quantitative and computational training for graduate students and postdocs. One of the areas of input we got from the community was that we should not limit it to graduate students and postdocs, and we should really push this back to undergraduates and even before. And so in the final version of the plan, um, we actually have uh, expanded that. So for instance, NIGMS has a number of undergraduate programs where this could be um, leveraged. And we actually now have a K through 12 education program, the SEPA program, where again, we could begin to leverage this. And then the third uh, strategic objective is to engage a broader community. So this is things like citizen science, working with librarian scientists. And in terms of the citizen science side, an area we're very um, actively pushing on is codathons, bug bounty programs, contests, to try to bring a much wider array of people into working on da data science related issues um, for biomedical research. So you can imagine, you know, there are high school kids out there who can do things that I, can, I can't even dream of myself. And if we could bring these guys into the, the system and let them you know, go to it for a few days, we really might get some very interesting things happening. Finally, appropriate policies to promote stewardship and sustainability. We need to develop policies that support this fair data ecosystem, data sharing policies, um, standardization policies, et cetera. But a very important point here is that those policies need to be achievable, not just aspirational, right? And so we could put a data sharing policy in place that says everyone has to share all their data for all eternity. And we already know from dbGaP that that's not going to work, okay? Um, it's just too expensive. Not all the data is, is useful. It would take all the money we have, plus a lot, to do that. And so we really need to figure out, you know, what data do we need to share? How do we share it? How do we decide, again, when does it go away? How long do we keep it? And these are things we're going to need the community to help us wrestle with. Uh, we also don't want to add unnecessary burden. You know, we could put a policy in place that makes you do all kinds of crazy stuff that adds no value, makes your institutions pay for all kinds of systems that add no value. Again, we really need to think this through carefully. And we, you know, we don't want to go for aspirational if it's not achievable and useful. And finally, enhancing the stewardship. We want to develop standards of use, a standard use and utility metrics, as I said, how much are certain data sets being used that will allow us to decide when to get rid of them, when to keep them. And we also want to come up with standard review expectations for data resources, knowledge bases, databases, and for tools development. And we want to establish sustainability models for data resources. Again, we can't keep every resource going forever, um, but there may be places where there's enough of a community that they can keep it going in some other way. And the NSF has experimented with models of this that have had some success. Um, and I think we need to think them through in advance and try to help the community uh, move to those more sustainable models when necessary. So finally, next step, the plan was delivered to Congress in May. It was actually discussed at the Senate hearings. Um, right at the beginning, Senator Murray talked about it, which was kind of nice. Um, the posting of the final plan is imminent. You should see it in the next few weeks, I hope. The implementation phase has already started. You know, things like the data commons you know about. Um, there's a big project going on to um, get um, cloud, um, leverage cloud space from the major providers in a way that would be useful not just for NIH, but accessible to the community, and we hope it would lower costs and increase access. Um, but this is going to be ramping up fast. This is a very ambitious plan. There's a lot of pieces to it, um, but it's very important. So we want to really want to get this going fast. And finally, performance measures and milestones is going to be key. We need help from you to decide what will be useful ones, what won't cause perverse things to happen if we implement them. And it's an area we're going to be working on very fast during this implementation phase. So thank you. Happy to take questions. Carol. So can you say um, a few words on the funding mechanisms you envision for this new landscape? Sure. So, I mean, there's lots of different pieces of it. In terms of the database, knowledge-based tools, we actually soon will have um, template funding opportunity announcements that the ICs can use that's, that have distinct features for um, the database and knowledge-based pieces. And so those should be... Hopefully, you know, you'll start seeing those in the next, within the next year, you'll start seeing those on the streets. 
And what we really need to do is disseminate them across the institute so everyone starts using these approaches to make them maximally useful. Tools development one will be following fast on the heels of that. So that's the first piece. But then there's all sorts of other places um, that we need to think about the appropriate funding mechanisms. For instance, in the work on, um, that I mentioned on getting cloud resources from major providers, um, they have some access to what's called other transaction authority, which is different than grants or contracts, and that's been very useful so far. So I think we're exploring other ways to interact with the ecosystem in ways that are more nimble and allow us to change direction quickly as technologies or processes evolve. So just, uh, just a, a couple comments. So one is I think what the, the diagram that you put up there is actually an architecture, right? And it forces people to fit a presupposed solution, um, which may or may not be the modernized solution. Correct. So by, by balkanizing funding, in this, in this way that's been articulated, the unintended consequences are that you won't be able to modernize fast enough. So Elixir does say that they recognize there's difference between, say, a data deposition archive and a knowledge base, but they don't then force them to be funded under separate or evaluated by separate mechanisms. There's still like an overarching uh, set of of uh, criteria against which those resources are evaluated, which allows the resources then to follow the trends in modern data science and architecture and software engineering and everything else. My fear is that this is going to put us at a disadvantage because it's painting us into a corner in many ways by funding what should be an interoperative ecosystem into separate components. So that, that's one thing. The, the other thing is it's, it's difficult for me, so there's one thing about the reliance on commercial, say, software, and then the bullet point underneath being open source, mm -hmm. and it, those are two opposite, like a lot of commercial software is not open, is black box, um, so even if it is an optimal solution, which I'm not sure how you actually measure that, it, it, it goes against the grain of being open source, so I think that's a problem for research. Yep. community. Yep. And then the final thing I'll say is that it costs a lot of money to generate data. Tons and tons of money to generate data. The cost of the curation, it's always brought up as this giant problem, but no one ever talks about the cost of actually generating the data and the return on investment for manual curation of some of this knowledge which makes it accessible to the development of new computational approaches, is the return on investment is quite high. So, I, you know, it's, it's like no, everyone wants to pay to have the data generated, but not for the stewardship costs. And I think stewardship costs should be factored into any large-scale data production enterprise. Um, so I know that was, that was covering a wide range, but this is really a very, very fundamental key it, it's an exciting area. It's great that there's this, this there's focus on it right now, but I'm really concerned about some of the directions that this is going in terms of the, the long-term consequences to data science. So I think, I mean, I think at some level the answer to all your questions is it's going to be a balance, right? That you know, there's no one black, one cookie cutter solution to everything. Um, and we certainly recognize, for instance, in the database knowledge base that there is a gray area and that it's going to evolve. So something can start off as a more dynamic knowledge base and eventually those components will harden and it will become a database. There are things that are in the middle. Again, I want to emphasize that the way this is organized, you can have still a data resource that's all three of those things. It's just the individual components need to be looked at separately to make sure each one is doing its job. Now, how do you define, in some cases, what's the data, what's the knowledge-based part? That's going to be a nuance. That's going to be up to reviewers um, at some level to decide. Um, I guess the pushback I would give you is, you know, you're saying that this is more hardened than the current system. The current system, again, is a completely historical one that goes back to the 1980s, 1990s, and has been completely hard-baked into the system and has created all of the inefficiencies that I described. The goal here is to break out of that. I'm sure we'll have to make tweaks along the way, 
Um, but if we just keep doing what we're doing, we'll never get any better, and we'll continue to live in the same inefficient and not maximally useful system that we currently live in. So I would say that there's been a, a ton of innovation to them. So I completely agree with you that it, it always makes sense to take a look at how these things are funded and, and think out of the box about better ways to do it. And I think some of the, the, some of the funding criteria and stuff that you put up, that's, that's amazing. I think the community really is going to embrace that concept very, very openly. Um, but, you know, if you look at what's come out of the way things have been funded, um, you mentioned a lot of inefficiencies, but the whole community can also point to many, many times when it's been transformational changes, things like sharing knowledge uh, through the Gene Ontology Consortium, for example, that completely transformed how genomics data were analyzed and how information about genome biology was shared across the community. That never would have happened um, necessarily under this particular funding mechanism. So I, I guess I, I don't see that point, but I mean, I agree with you. There are absolutely yeah. transformative things. I don't necessarily see why transformative things aren't completely possible, maybe more possible under this, this conception. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, but just to emphasize one thing, in terms of um, curation, you're absolutely right that some curation is incredibly high value, but I think it needs to be assessed, you know, on its merits and not linked to things that the community says, I don't want to say anything about it because if we lose that, we're doomed, right? Yeah. Thanks for that presentation. So my first question, I have two, is uh, it comes from my experience, 15 years experience developing tools and analyzing data, where I often find that when there's a, two different groups, one deciding what the formats are and one deciding how to analyze it, are separate. It often happens that the, the, the formats that are selected aren't optimal for, for analysis. And it, I mean, and what we end up doing often is just skip, skipping around those formats and getting the raw data. Mm -hmm. So all that effort was a waste of time. <laughs> so I, I wonder if there's going to, if you have, any, have that put any thought into how you can improve that, 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 that has been happening yeah. so often, not just in the NIH. I mean, that's it's a really good point. Um, and certainly we would value your feedback on how to improve that. Our, our conception, and again, your feedback's important here is that we need to let help the community figure out the correct standards. But I think your point may be, A, that the right people aren't always at the table. That's point number one. But then maybe, two, you don't know what the future is going to be. So you could come up with a standard right now, and then you develop a new algorithm, right, that doesn't work for that standard. Yeah. So the, the second one's really hard to deal with because it's the nature of this incredibly quickly evolving system. The first one, I think, is solvable. We just need to make sure the right people are there and, and their voice is heard and what they need is incorporated and then used. Oh, that, that's good to hear. So my second question relates to the separation of tools and data generation, which I, in general, think is a good idea. Uh, so, so you have often you have very talented data generators that include people who develop great new technologies, new laboratory techniques. They're not, all, they're not necessarily the best tool developers because you can't be the best at everything. So then you have the best tool developers over here, and the, but the data generators need the paper, so they need to analyze the data. So they'll figure out how to do it. They'll hire a postdoc and make them become the data analysts. Uh, or her, and the the problem then is if, if you're gonna say let's just have the data, data generators just generate the data and let other tool developers develop the tools, how, have, has there been any thought into how to make how to reward the data generators? Yeah, if they're not getting absolutely. Data. So that's one of the things we talk about in the plan is ways to give credit for, for instance, data sets. Software is another one where you can make incredibly useful software tool. Sometimes it's published, so that's great, but you know, how do you get credit for something that somebody made that may not be published? Um, so having DOIs, having ways to give credit for those things appear on a CV, 
a biosketch. Um, that's part of what we're going to have to figure out how to do. Absolutely. Um, Is that Aviv? Aviv, go ahead. Jump in now. Just because of the specific area. So this is actually something that in Human Cell Atlas we've discussed uh, at great length multiple times because the plan for our data is to be open. And um, one of the critical points that was raised and we've actually been discussing with journals recently is not just to have DOIs for data, but to also have journals leave enough room for citing it later on. Because journals still largely limit the number of citations, and you can imagine that as you move to integrative yeah. analysis and you use a lot of data sources and there are a lot of DOIs, you could end up with no ability to cite, even if you have the best of intentions. So I think this is something where the NIH can actually play an important role in making sure that results are acknowledged also in the way in which citations can be provided. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, just to uh, emphasize that, I agree with with Aviv, and it would be great if NIH could come up with standards that the journals could follow. That would be an excellent. So there's a model for this. So NIH, Larry Tabak can convene a group of journal, you may have been there, Mark, uh, journal editors to talk about reproducibility, and they came up with sort of a set of principles and some standards for what they were going to do there. For instance, no limits on method sections. We could do something similar. It's a really good idea. Um, can you explain a little more the role of NCBI and NLM in this? I, it seems to me they had to have a lead role. I agree, 100%. And, and my personal feeling is that they should be absolutely at the center, NCBI especially at the center of this. Um, you know, I think this is an opportunity to take the great stuff that's there and really leapfrog it into something that's going to point the way for the rest of the century, the way, you know, 1980 happens sort of. Um, so I, I completely agree with that. So, so you, you said uh, at one point I mean, we can't store everything forever, right? So I, I'm just curious, I mean, like, like obviously there are costs that accumulate as you, you know, what's, is, it, is it the actual storage costs that are currently causing or, or you anticipate as issues or is it the curation costs, like just taking you know, dbGaP as an example, uh, you know, you, I, I think you reference it in the context of containing too much data, but to me yeah. the issues seem both to be both different those, there. So right. Both those things are true. Um, I mean, are, are we actually running up against the storage costs as being a, a, a rate limiter? Or is it more the curation costs than the... the dbGaP, it has been. I mean, the BAM files, it, it's just too much, right? And we, that we've had to make some choices. Um, you know, of course, storage costs go down, but the trouble is that the size of data keeps going up, and it sort of outpaces the, the decrease in storage costs has been a problem. And then you also come up with this question of, at what point do the curves of cost of generating or regenerating data and cost of storage cross each other? And there are places where it's going to be actually cheaper when someone needs some data to regenerate it than to store it for long periods of time. And that's another thing we need to wrestle with in this whole question. Let's be curious if you were like, I mean, just this, it'd be interesting to just look at a simple matrix of, you know, how, how many entries are there in geo, right? And what do those collectively add up to versus how many entries are there in dbGaP and what do those collectively add up to, right? Like, so something like geo, the kind of resource that at its current rate could just keep doing what it's doing forever, right? right? And it's really just these massive human data sets that are causing the issue where we have to grapple with doing something more um, sophisticated. Absolutely. But of course, we don't know what other kinds of data sets will be coming online. So cryo EM is something we're particularly interested in generating enormous quantities of data. What, with, what of that do you store? How, again, how long? All the same question. I guess my point is that 95% of the community will generate data sets that are entirely manageable, right? And it's really Absolutely. just this restricted subset that are creating the headaches. That, well, not except, a, not a, I don't mean except, that in a pejorative way. but Except that the total data that the community is generating is very large, even if individual pieces are small. And so that's that point I talked about earlier, was how do we store that in a way that's accessible? How do we decide... You, know, you don't want all the kinetics gels from my lab, probably, right? Maybe you do. I'll give them to you. But, but you know, those, those are the questions. When we're talking about data sharing and storage, what, what do you want? I mean, what do we mean by data? 
So we're going to go Jonathan and then Steve and, and then uh, Dan Roden on the phone. Okay, so just um, following up on that, that a little bit, you, you made a comment about re regenerating the data may be cheaper. That's provided you can regenerate yep. the data. There are certain resources that may be very limited and you can't do that. Yep. So th that may factor into what you, how you decide to do that. I, I wanted to actually go back a little bit. And second, one of the things that, that Carol said, um, when, when she was talking about the, the commercial and open source software, I mean, it, it, I think it's really important that we not overemphasize the commercial software because it is often a black box and it does, having the open source I think is a much better way of, of doing things if we can possibly do it. So we, you know, I agree. There has I, to be a balance. Can I just add a point to that? I mean, I think we agree, although there are places where, you know, the tech industry is so far ahead of us that they really have the best thing and, and so you have to decide which do you want. Um, an additional question though is when an algorithm say is developed in academia, what we've heard from lot enough, I hope I don't offend anyone now, but what we've heard from lots of sources is in general, the level of code that an academic program has is not up to industry standards. And we heard an example from Eric Dishman of when he was in Intel, he worked with very prominent uh, academic center on their code and because they understood the architecture of the Intel chips, they were able to increase the speed of the program by rewriting it by a thousand fold relative to what had been written there. So what are we going to do to help this problem? And so there's this idea of finding ways to allow what we call systems integrators or systems engineers to work with academic groups on particularly high value algorithms or prototype programs to bring them up to industry standards of speed and efficiency and utility. Um, and so that would be a way where we're paying for an industry standard group to, to, to do things at the industry level, but still we can make it as an open source kind of thing. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And I think one of the things is to hold the, the academics to a higher standard of, of coding, because a lot of that stuff really isn't very, very good. It's kludged together and, and we do this all the time, right? And uh, because it's for our own purposes, and then right. we, you know, so I think holding holding the academic uh, folks to a higher standard would would be would be something. And then just one more just one more point. I think amplifying something that Raphael said uh, when you're, and I I get the idea of separating the databases and the knowledge bases and the tools, but what's the incentive now for the academic community to do the databases if they don't have the other stuff? If the only thing they're doing is putting that data together. It's not a very academically satisfying kind of thing. So what's the incentive for, for the academic community to want to continue to do the database? Well, I mean, I guess one question you guys, what's the incentive for the academic community to do any user service resource? And hopefully there is some, which is, you know, there's some sense that this is an important function. Um, going back to what was said earlier, though, you know, I do think that NCBI for some of these core things really makes a lot of sense to me that, you know, they are, you know, they're just set up to provide resource and access to the community. So maybe that's where we should move some of those core functions uh, and then let the higher level things where knowledge is being accumulated and hopefully refined happen in the academic community. But that's just an idea. Okay, Steve and then Dan Roden and then Trey. Yeah, just a quick question. You, you mentioned briefly during your presentation about looking at some other fields, like, for example, astronomy. Yeah. And I was just curious how you're thinking about that, because it, it certainly seems to me that they face a lot of the same questions, and there's certainly a tremendous amount of data being generated yes. today, yes. and it is replacing older data all the time. Yeah. Um, Another area is, of course, something like NOAA or something, you know, Absolutely. when you start to take a look at weather patterns and this sort of thing. So how are you thinking about that and so, what kind of lessons have yeah, you learned? Yeah, that's a great point. One of the ways we're thinking about it is, and this is very explicit in the plan, is to have as much collaboration and coordination with other federal agencies and international agencies as possible. Um, both, you know, somewhere like NSF that has more similar data, at least in some spheres to us, but also things like NOAA, yeah, and Department of Energy etc., um, to learn their lessons and help them learn what we're doing as well, and to leverage one another's resources, because if we're building redundant, un unnecessarily redundant things, that doesn't make sense either. Um, 
we are we did as part of the plan look at some of those case studies um, and think about them, but we need to continue as we implement to, to do that as well. Yeah, it, I mean, it seems to me that in biology that you're constantly, you know, the definition of what constitutes raw data versus how it gets mixed up with biological data yes. is some is somewhat confusing. Yes. And, um, you know, maybe it's much more straightforward if you take a CCD image of a, a region of space. Yep. But I'd be curious as to whether or not you could decompose things so that you actually did have a pure data versus, whoops, versus mixing it up with, with biology. Yeah. Uh, Dan Roden on the phone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Thank uh, That was uh, a very helpful overview. Can you give us some sense of your thinking or the group's thinking on what the mechanism for funding this very large mm. new effort within NIH might be? I, that is a key question. And I think one, there's two pieces of it. One piece is the institutes all have funding in this space. Can we, through these kinds of corporate endeavors, make the system more efficient so that they can get more for their money um, by contributing to some of the collective efforts? Um, so that's one part of it. And hopefully that will encourage them to contribute more because they see the value. And I think that's a piece that's been missing is, is the siloing um, is in part well, I, because I, I will say that we have continual discussions in this council of who should fund Flybase, yes. who should fund this, that, or the other database that we feel like we contribute disproportionately compared to other users in the community. So this is an important question for this yeah. council in particular. And I, I, I think Eric and I, as Eric will tell you, have talked many, many hours about that exact point. And the Scientific Data Council actually has talked about it quite a lot. Um, and one of the reasons that we came to that knowledge-based, database, tools development um, separation was because of, of that particular space, was that we, we came to the conclusion that in order to get a corporate solution to that problem, and your problem is a historical one, right? It's that you started, NHGRI started funding these things back when they were, um, you know, part and parcel of the, bringing the Human Genome Project along. Um, now we're many decades or several decades later, and, and does that make sense? So we need a corporate solution, but to get one, we really have to convince everybody that we have a much more efficient way of doing things and a, much, uh, a way that's going to be much better for all of their grantees, and that's where much of this came from. And, and to emphasize, I know you've implied it, but to emphasize it, we all concluded, you being a clear champion of it, that this, and Congress asked you actually for it, the strategic plan needed to be the first thing done. Right. You couldn't have conversations about broader corporate right. funding models and plans without the blueprint. So the strategic plan is a blueprint. It's just coming public, and now the next big thing we're going to be doing is thinking about how we're going to corporately be funding. Right. I mean, you know, let's just put things on the table here. I think the likelihood of NHGRI is being able to go around to the ICs and say, um, would you fund fly-based, worm-based, you know, each of these things individually uh, contribute to their funding. In the long term is very, you know, you might get a few years here and there, but you're never going to get a long-term solution to that. The way to get a long-term solution is to create a unified data resource out of these things, right, in a, in a way that's more efficient, more clearly useful. I, th again, I think leverages NCBI. Um, and therefore is a corporate tool that many different communities will use. Um, that's something I think the ICs would be willing to contribute to in the long term. But a piecemeal one-off, you know, give us a little money here and there for each of these silos, it's not going to work. And, and again, that's going to be radical. Change. It's, gonna it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a few years right, at least. Trey? Okay. Any last comments? Anyone on the phone? Oh, Carol? Um, so NLM hasn't been mentioned in your overview. Is well, NCBI, I talked about a lot. Right. NLM. But um, and, and NLM, I think, as an overarching component is, is critically important to many of these places. Um, you think about the electronic health record stuff, both in their intramural program and extramurally. They're one of the leaders in thinking about how to utilize EHRs, which are going to be um, transformative when we figure out exactly how to do it. Um, bringing the information scientists, the library scientists into the system. Um, is, I think something that many institutions are, rest, are wrestling with. I know when I was at Hopkins, um, figuring out what to, how to reconfigure the library, the medical library, was key. And, and nascent issues that we talked about here were all part of that discussion. 
And, and, and the other key component, and John, I don't think you were quite in my director's report when I mentioned it, but I showed the advert for the recently launched yes, recruitment I should have for mentioned that. the Thank NIH you. chief data strategist. And yeah. so that will be, again, a, a reporting directly to the NIH director. This person will play a key role in the Scientific Data Council, will play a key role in coordination across institutes with NLA, all that. So that's another key component. So the, la the only last thing I'll say is that your emphasis, like on workforce development, I think is really very, very important. We haven't had many comments about that, but I think that is that is essential, um, and the citizen science component to that. I think that's that's pretty innovative and new, and hopefully there'll be funds for that as, yes, as well. Yes, I, I think, um, and there's places to partner with other organizations as well. There. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you, John. We knew this was going to be an important discussion. We appreciate you coming out here and talking to us. So thank you. Okay, you've earned lunch, uh, but first we need to take our family photo. May is the council photo uh, time. So uh, the weather is permitting. I think we're going to oh. send something in, Avi. Oh. <laughs> but let's this be back. Dan, yeah, oh, sorry, Dan. Um, let's be back at 1.15 to resume with the open session of concept clearance.